Good afternoon friends and welcome to the SCP training webinar series. The topic for which today is AI test generation, what we have learned so far. Our speaker for the day is Kevin Suras. I am Smita Mishra, a professional tester myself, and I'm excited to host you all and Kevin on our STP webinars. Quick information for all of you, there is an upcoming webinar zero automation to zero, zero fear in more than zero minutes on 22nd of May. The speaker is Brian Fitzpatrick, who is the quality engineer for Gannett. It's going to be mostly uh, useful to you if you are wanting to look at some of the basics around transitioning to DevOps. The link is up for you to review and register. Please do go for it. And if you are on Twitter, please share the conference information and about this webinar with your followers and connections. You can also add STP's Twitter handle to your tweets, which is at Software Test Pro. You can also note down the speaker's Twitter handle, which is at Kevin Surace. All right, let's get started with the webinar today. A very warm welcome, Kevin. We are very thrilled to have you with us today. And let me quickly introduce you for all of us here. So Kevin, uh, Kevin Surace is the CEO and CTO of AppVents.ai and has been awarded 84 patents worldwide. He led pioneering work on the first cellular data smartphone, air communicator, the first plastic multi-chip semiconductor package, the first human-like AI virtual assistant portico, soundproof drywall, high R-value windows, AI-driven management technology, AI-driven building management, sorry, technology, AI-driven QA automation, and the window energy retrofits of the Empire State Building and New York Stock Exchange. Kevin has been featured by Business Week, Time, Fortune, Forbes, CNN, ABC, MSNBC, Fox News, and has keynoted hundreds of events from INC 5000 to TED to the US Congress. He was INC Magazine's Entrepreneur of the Year, a CNBC Top Innovator of the Decade, World Economic Forum Tech Pioneer, Chair uh, of Silicon Valley Forum, Planet Forward Innovator of the Year nominee, featured for five years on Tech TV's Silicon Spin, and inducted into RIT's Innovation Hall of Fame. Clearly, this is the profile of a world-renowned speaker and technopreneur. It gives me immense pleasure to inform the attendees that Kevin will also be keynoting at our next STP Con, which will be at Boston in September. Okay, testing people. Let's get started with the discussion on some real world challenges around AI testing and look at where AI and where, where AI works and where it doesn't. Very warm welcome again, Kevin, and the floor is all yours. Well, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, I guess, wherever you are. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining. That, uh, Smitha, that was one heck of an intro. I don't know how to beat that. <laughs> I don't know what am I gonna say now <laughs> to, to match that. <clears throat> well, look, I'm honored to be here. Um, we love this field, and 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 the way I look at uh, software testing is, we have a chance to change the way software development happens uh, in this generation and for the next generation. And so we've always got to be looking at um, what we can do to go faster to make our applications better. They're getting more complex. Um, they're getting harder to test. They're getting harder to keep up with testing. And so we've got to use technology to help us. There's just not enough humans in the world to test all the applications and the, the depth of the applications that are that are being um, uh, developed today. So uh, I wanted to share what we've learned so far. Uh, uh, so that's the title of this AI test generation, what we what we learned so far. And uh, I'm going to try to share as much as I as much as I can in the short period of time that we've got. So the first thing is that when we talk about AI as a field, AI is already seeing great success in the last two or three or four years in all of these areas, in banking, financial trading. And I don't mean in QA in these areas. I mean in these areas for these companies and these types of companies doing other kinds of things, right? So we're seeing this already. And there's obvious places here like image analysis, certainly uh, uh, marketing, uh, detecting abnormal human behaviors, et cetera. So it's not that AI doesn't work. It absolutely works and it already works in many areas. And so we want to investigate 
what can we do in in our field? And um, I like to start with this. This is, I think, uh, this was shared with me with uh, 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 by another uh, friend some time ago. And there is this perception of AI that is basically driven by scientists in Hollywood, and it's about multiple tasks and understanding lots and lots of things. And it's like the movie Her or other movies like that. That's the general public's idea of AI. It has nothing to do with reality. Don't waste your time thinking about that. That is not coming to your job anytime soon. It's not even coming to the world anytime soon. Um, what we do and what professionals focus on is a very, very extremely narrow use of AI. And that's driven by industry and it's trying to, to, to leverage this kind of math in one task in something practical that can help us or augment what we do. That's what professionals work on. So we need to separate out what Hollywood so shows us and, and, and really apply this technology to one particular problem. Like at Facebook, they used it for facial recognition. And then they began to name people in your photos three or four years ago and say, do you want me to tag your brother or your mom or your sister or your friend? And at first it was spooky. And after that, we said, this is actually a pretty, pretty good feature. It's a very, very narrow application. And note that they had a huge database of tagged photos with names, meaning billions and billions and billions of photos to train that AI on and build a deep neural net over around facial recognition, tagging it to names, which is called supervised <clears throat> machine learning. So they were able to do that because of that huge database. It was a very narrow track. So for us, I like to think, first of all, AI is much more of a marketing term. Uh, it's, there is no real artificial intelligence. People might argue with me on this, but but I uh, all AI is, is, is a moniker above really machine learning. And machine learning has been around for 50 to 60 years now. We have lots and lots of ways to have a machine learn. Most of those methods were impractical until recently for a couple of reasons. But the largest reason is the advent of cloud computing. So now that we've got access to the cloud, to use even these very traditional machine learning algorithms, we no longer need to go out and buy a Cray computer for $100 million or 200 or 500 million dollars. Instead, we can leverage literally thousands of CPUs in the cloud for our problem for one or two or three hours and learn what we need to learn and move on. And so we can rent that access to unlimited memory and unlimited CPU horsepower. That changes our ability to look at 50 years of machine learning work that, that 10 years ago would have taken you know, three years to, 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 to run a model on, and today we might run that model in a few hours because, again, the cloud has had a, a big impact. And of course, the impact of deep neural nets as they've become uh, available to us, in effect, available to us in the cloud over the last few years. So that's what's going on there. And I want you to think of AI more as it's machine learning and it's only math, and it's not math you will ever have to do. There are professionals who do this math who then deliver something to you. That's the most important thing to recognize. You don't need to learn any of this. You just need to know it's just math. It's nothing to be scared of. <clears throat> and in fact, when we look at overall machine learning algorithms, here's a, a very good list of about 100, all of which are available to us in the business to say, hey, I am going to use this uh, salmon mapping algorithm as part of dimensional reduction because that's going to work in this particular thing, uh, a Bayesian network, a gradient boosting machines, blah, blah, blah. I'm not an expert in all of these particular uh, uh, methods, uh, but there are people are, that are, and mostly it's math, and it's math that the coding, in fact, is well understood because we've been doing it for a long time. So just know it's just math, that's all it is, it's not that scary. Now to pick what kind of machine learning one wants to use, you have to look at how much data do I have? What's the data size and then versus the model performance, right? So traditional machine learning works on very small data sets. That's really good because it turns out, we believe, I believe that in QA, we actually have a small data set, not a large data set. I'm gonna get into that and why that is. Now, other people believe it's a large data set. And if you believe it's a large data set and you can go out and scan the world's applications, well, then you would use a large neural net. That might make sense. Maybe you can learn something from that. 
We don't think so, and I'm going to describe why and why um, uh, I chose and our team chose to use much more traditional machine learning than large neural nets uh, for a number of reasons, as you'll see. So back in 2015, maybe even 2014, we had to ask, first of all, what do we want to achieve? People want to talk about, oh, AI is good for this and good for that. If we just say AI is a marketing term, what is it that we're trying to achieve for our client base, right? For users, what are we trying to achieve? How are we trying to move the industry forward? What algorithms and methods would be best to achieve that? Will people trust it? By the way, this is a big question. Would you trust it if the system said, I found 42 bugs? Maybe not on day one. And we'll talk about that and what we've seen. And then will people buy it? That's another thing. You know, you've got an industry that, oh, for a decade or so, has maybe 15 years, has lived on open source. I, I would have a big argument that you kind of got what you pay for. You have, you have an awful lot of things that open source doesn't do, but people have gotten used to, oh, software's free. Well, it isn't free when you want support and it isn't free when you want AI. And it's just, you know, you got to get past that. So will people actually buy it? And, and uh, at Advance, we delivered our first MVP to clients in 2017, um, minimum viable product with AI. So we'll talk about that. And that's why we've learned a lot over two years about what works and what doesn't work. I like this question and I pose it to you because I think it's a question you should ask yourself. You should ask your teams. We should ask the industry. Who cares if it's AI? Great, it's a marketing term. You know, we care if it solves a real problem. Using AI for the sake of putting AI on your website because it does some little thing over here is almost immaterial if it doesn't advance the state of the art. If it doesn't give us a 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80% boost, I'm glad you applied AI to this problem, but it's not a really huge problem that I have. It's a nice application of AI, but it, you know, who cares, right? So in 2019, now dozens of vendors talk about uh, uh, AI coming to QA. Almost none have delivered anything. It's really fascinating. Um, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You can go to 100 websites and see this. Um, almost none discuss the real benefit to QA. They say, oh, well, we're going to apply AI maybe in this area. And you go, how does that benefit me? It's interesting, but, but, but just to use the term AI to sell me something? I don't think so. I don't think this is helpful. But it's very common in every new industry and in every new technology, and it's happened um, over millennia. <laughs> over millennia, so it's not new. And this is a this is a great chart that I use all the time in my talks. That you've got this technology trigger that happens. In this case, it's AI, and it's over the last four or five years, AI became hip again. And then you get the peak of inflated expectations. And I would argue that were is sort of in that area today, or maybe a little past that area. You get this these inflated expectations that everyone thinks AI is just going to take over all of QA and, and everybody's going to be out of a job and it's just going to run and it's just going to be automated. And of course, that isn't what's being delivered. And in fact, that's not even what most people can promise today. And so then you drop too far down the other way and you go through the trough of disillusionment. You tried three or four vendors that said AI, you downloaded something for free, it didn't work, it doesn't do anything that you can't do already. And you go, this, this is just a pile of junk, and so I'm disillusioned, I'm, I'm not happy. And finally, you come into what's called the slope of enlightenment, where, where vendors actually start to finally deliver on some portion of the promise, not the inflated expectations, but reasonable expectations, and you start to engage with those and learn from them and, and take your time, and eventually you get that plateau of productivity that isn't as high as the inflated expectations, but it's really high compared to what you do today. So we're somewhere today between the peak of inflated expectations and the trough of disillusionment, depending on how long you've been following this. That, that's, that's, that's how I would uh, state it anyway. So if we ask the question, then you'd say, well, one could use AI and QA to do many things. Here are a few that I thought of. You could recognize objects better. You know, recognizing objects, accessors change their dynamic, et cetera. That's interesting, actually. You can use OCR, which is sort of a form of AI. In fact, OCR used to be called AI some time ago. Now we just call it OCR um, because it's just normal. But you could recognize objects better. It's a good idea. Um, might help in, in our work. You can help pinpoint the cause of errors. I think it's interesting. I think it's a really hard problem, but it's an interesting idea. Digging into the source code and trying to find the exact line of code that might be involved or the exact section of code. 
self heal scripts, we introduced that back in 2016. So that's an obvious area for AI. It was actually our first kind of instantiation in, in light AI or machine learning. Um, and it's an obvious use of machine learning uh, to self heal scripts. Um, automatically generate tests and, and find bugs. Um, I think that's the biggest area. We'll talk about that in a minute. Could generate legit test data. That's kind of uh, super interesting. Um, but, the, but the bottom line in our take was, if you wanted people to accept this, you have to reduce the overall QA time. The time to create tests, the time to maintain tests, and the time to run tests, and with it coverage. So if you do that, whatever you decide to do, then people will say, this is interesting to me. If it doesn't reduce the time spent, the human time spent, I don't know what you're doing because people already have a, a, a full plate, right? They're not going to have time to, to investigate this. So we spent some time actually spending time with QA teams and say, where do you spend your time? And this isn't going to be a surprise to anyone that in fact, people spend most of their time across the industry in either manual testing or writing scripts or fixing slash maintaining scripts. That's where all the time is spent. Running tests usually isn't a lot of people time. In fact, today it's often kicked off by CICD. It runs itself, it does its own thing. Analyzing tests, there is time spent for sure. A lot of that is more dev time than it is QA time, but there is you know, obviously time to debug it and find the bugs. There's other stuff that happens. But, but by far, I think most people in, uh, in, in QA teams are spending their time either manually testing or writing tests or fixing tests. And so it seemed to us that that would be the most interesting area to try to attack. Anything else that we attacked was attacking two or three or 5% of someone's time. I, we said we should go after most of their time, right? So that's, that's what we decided to do. And that doesn't mean that that's the right thing to do. It was just, we just thought that was pretty obvious to, to, to us. So we set our own goals of AI and QA that could be different than everyone else's goal. I don't know if they're the right goals is just the ones we set and I'm just sharing them, sharing them with you. Um, we wanted to virtually eliminate test maintenance. Test maintenance is a headache. Uh, it's painful. It seems like a waste of time. Arguably, if you designed your application for test in the first place, there would be virtually no test maintenance. That's true. But, but devs don't want to do that. They don't want to, uh, uh, you know, make accessors non-dynamic and static. Uh, which you can do, by the way, you could set a test ID and have that test ID carry all the way through and that would virtually eliminate test maintenance except for, for new user flows. But they don't do it, so we're in this constant battle with dev, right? And, and we're not gonna win that battle all the time, but we're, we're gonna have to virtually eliminate test maintenance. Can we use AI to do that? Maybe. Could we automatically generate thousands of valid scripts in a few minutes? That was our goal. The answer is we, we achieved that goal two years ago. We've been delivering it. It is really, really cool. It does not eliminate other specific use cases that you're going to write. And we'll talk about how that really works. Uh, we wanted to validate virtually anything uh, through the AOT without writing a single script. Could we, so today, you know, we call it, uh, um, uh, you know, looking for certain things to exist, right? Uh, assert exists, et cetera. That's how we code it today in a, in a script. But if you go to another level, you're saying, all I'm trying to do is validate something that a human could see is there and it was accurate. Is it the right data? Is it the right output? Is it the right JPEG? Is it the right layout? Humans do that with their eyes. We naturally do that. So I want to validate like a human would validate. Uh, we want to find four, far more important bugs. With that come some unimportant bugs probably. And we want to make that the centerpiece of a continuous test and deploy, which we all believe in it's hard to do but we all believe in it so those were some of the goals um, um, we set now we looked at deep learning models and there are ways to use deep learning in qa we were not successful in finding the outcomes that we wanted to to meet these goals there may be other goals you can meet. There's some really interesting things you can do, including object recognition and recognition of some con consistent pathways and things. But, but there is a problem using neural nets. You need a huge consistent data set. You, need, uh, you have to be limited to near zero noise in the data or very low noise in the data because noise throws off your results. 
So examples obviously are image recognition, speech recognition, translation. These are obvious places where you have huge databases. Uh, and like translation, you have a huge database of how to translate. And so you can go learn to do that and then do it automatically. It makes sense to do that. Does it make sense in QA? And, and we had a problem with it. Uh, although there is a lot of literature on um, uh, at universities, you know, using neural nets to come up with some kind of something interesting for, for software tests. Um, you know, the, the, what you'd have to do is go out and learn how every application in the world works. So image recognition is an obvious one, and I put it there, that obviously you can go out and start to learn how everybody builds buttons, and you can start to say, this must be a button, because it looks like a button, it acts like a button, it's probably a button, so I think that's interesting. Um, there's There's been a lot of interesting work. I think it's absolutely fascinating work. I don't think it, I don't think it results in anything that's gonna help your job. That's the problem, I mean, really impact your job. So what we found is that when you go out and scan every application in the world, the data is too noisy you have inconsistent usage of apps. As the purpose of the apps is different. They have different reasons for being, right? So every application has a different reason for it being and a different set of user flows and a different set of outcomes. You've got different libraries that were used in these applications, especially on the web. Did they use React.js? Did they use Angular 1 and 2? Did they just use regular Ajax? Are they using something at Kendo UI, et cetera, et cetera, right? Some other library that was just invented last week. Um, so that's got a whole set of inconsistencies. You've got different coders that can take the same libraries, even the same user flows, but code them completely differently. But you don't know exactly it's the same user flow because it is coded differently and you've got no one to tell you or teach you. So you don't really have a supervised uh, learning situation. You've got an unsupervised learning situation. And out of this, you can learn a few things. Um, you can learn that there's certain ways to log into applications, which I think is interesting. You can learn a few other things. But we couldn't find that you could learn enough because of all this noise. And so we don't think that leveraging neural nets, except for possibly image recognition, in QA is going to result in the kind of gains in QA that everybody wants to see, that everybody wants in their shop, right? So we've sort of abandoned this as a, as, as, as a tool from a math perspective. And and gone to much much more traditional machine learning in QA. And we have a number of patents in this area. You can go read our, our, our patents um, uh, that, are, that are out there. Uh, it's a fairly seminal patent to actually doing this particular thing. So um, using traditional machine learning, we can run very fast and on demand in the cloud. And we can do something in an hour or less. Um, and I don't have to take days because I'm not trying to learn that much. I'm only trying to learn certain things. We decided to learn just from your app and your specific build, this build and this application. We're gonna carry over some things that, that we did in the prior build, but only certain things, what, what we call a template. And that applies, uh, uh, so we apply that to creating legitimate tests. So we learn from your application and we say, can we create tests against this application? We can also learn from standard production logs. Standard production logs are interesting. Most QA people don't you probably don't know they exist, but they do for security reasons. But there's no binaries in there. There, there. There's actually no information that's particularly useful except for rest calls, gets, puts, posts, et cetera. But they're, they're, but they're large data sets of you know, 20, 30, 40 gigs or larger over the course of even a week. So there's a lot we can glean from that about how the application might have been used at the API level. And if we learn from the overall application how it works, we can begin to connect the pieces for an end-to-end -end test or UX actions to the API level. That's a very interesting idea, and you can totally read about how we do this in, in our patents, so I, I won't go into it here if it interests you. It's, it's math, it might not interest you at all, but it's kind of interesting. Um, and then, uh, so we've designed a, a code generator, which is a JS code generator, jo generates JavaScript, and it'll write about 5,000 scripts in 10 minutes. That's amazing, and those scripts are absolutely maintenance-free because they're written against the existing build. And when you have a new build, we write them against the next build. So it self-maintains, not by changing the scripts, but literally by throwing them away and generating them again. Now, this is an interesting learning experience. It says if you can generate scripts quickly, you don't need to maintain them. If I can generate 5,000 scripts in 10 minutes, there's nothing to maintain, I will throw them away and generate new ones. That's what's fascinating. So our whole, uh, life of maintenance is because it takes so long to write scripts that work. 
But if a machine can write them in 10 minutes, well, then I'll just throw them away and write new ones. There's no reason to maintain them. It's a whole new way of thinking about writing our tests. Um, and and uh, But I'll, I'm going to show you how this works uh, uh, in a moment. So uh, I'm going to stop here and open it up for questions. We'll see if there are any questions. So, so for AI test generation, again, there could be AI used in image recognition. There could be AI used in lots of things. But for us, we said, let's generate tests leveraging AI, leveraging machine learning. And in the end, we find that that augments testing. Now, it'll automatically generate all these different kinds of tests. It has nearly 100% user flow test coverage for what your users did because we learned from that big data set of, of production API logs. There's no coding or scripting or manual testing. It frees the team from manual testing and scripting to focus on generating better and more test data, evaluating test results, and improving test coverage. And this is what we found over the last two years. Yes, some manual testers you know, may not be as needed anymore, but this is the case with all automation, right? All test automation over the last 20 years. But what we're finding is with the automation engineers, they move from I'm scripting every day to I'm evaluating these results. I am trying to generate better and more test data, and I'm improving the test coverage. So they're elevated to another level as opposed to doing the mundane stuff. And, and when you think back, you know, sitting there writing Selenium scripts all day is pretty mundane. It's actually not a good use of your time. The best of use, use of your time, the best use of human time is to evaluate these results and let a machine write as many of those as possible, maybe not all. So I'm just gonna open it to questions, Smith. If there are any questions, love to take them now. We'll take a quick break to answer some questions and then we'll go on. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of them, uh, Kevin. So yeah. in fact, they're flowing at a very fast rate now. So Okay, okay. that's because I said I'm open for questions. So we'll take a few quickly. <laughs> yeah, so we'll take a couple of them quickly, which are more relevant to the part you're already done with. So there is this question that says, what kind of JS scripts are generated? Uh, if you're going to take them up on the demo, then we can skip that for now. Well, I'm going to show you. I'm, I'll show you the scripts. I'm not going to demo anything oh. today. Yeah. By okay. the way, the funny thing with AI is real AI, there's really nothing to demo. I mean, you push a button and there's some scripts, but you can't, mm -hmm. since you can't see what AI does, it's a little disappointing, I hate to say, yeah. but except yeah. that you go, wow, look at all those scripts that got generated. And then you go, how did it work? Well, there's an AI engine. There's nothing to see inside the AI is it's one of the complaints about AI overall. Uh, but I'm going to show you the JS script. And by the way, these JS scripts can work at the API level or the UX level. You can set how many you want to generate, uh, uh, and uh, which typically is about three, four, five thousand 5,000 is what we see people pick. And I can get into the reasons why. But more than 5,000, even heading towards 10,000, you start to get too many duplicates and we wipe out the duplicates. So what happens over time is the generation engine is generating scripts and it gets slower and slower and slower. Not because it's generating less scripts, it's generating less unique scripts because we're finding the same flows over and over and over again and we, and we eliminate those. So you go from generating the unique ones very fast to hardly ever seeing a unique one and then the engine stops and says, this is a complete waste of everybody's time. Let's run the 5,000 that we've got. Mm -hmm. um, what does the system or build has to generate for the AI test generation to use as input and generate the test scripts? Great. Uh, well, there, I'm going to show you this. There's two sections. We blueprint an application, which means we're learning all the flows of an application, and then we write scripts. It turns out in the blueprinting, we generate a smoke report that will find 80 or 90 percent of the bugs we will ever find in that application it's actually quite good and i will show you how we do that and then it generates these regression scripts based on uh, based on what users might have done in production and applies them to uh, to the current build so there's nothing you have to do but uh, you know the, compile your application and put it up on your qa server and it's ready to go it's it's an you know it's post integration right this is not happening at the source code level so this is after devs have you know turned it over and got a master build or some potential release build and you're ready to test great so i'm going to take one more question right now kevin and there are quite a few of them asking about the outputs and the kinds of scripts and yeah. a lot of different things which i believe would be more clearer once you discuss about once you show us the js scripts yeah. so this question is uh it seems like the differences between like between like scripts from one build to the next could tell us about whether the application is working properly or if something has changed. We would want to know about those changes, correct? 
Well, that's a very, I love the question. It's a very good question and one we focused on a lot. Sure, the truth is we would see the differences between them, but here's the problem. The problem is we don't know if you wanted those differences, that is, those are bug fixes, those are user flow changes, or you didn't want them. And, and this is a tricky question. So this sort of let's go backwards and compare it to the last build is a dangerous thing because you might find thousands of differences and now you got to sit there and go through them and say, is this a difference I want to happen or not want to happen? What we do instead is we say, here are production user flows from whatever's been in production. Can we apply those as close as possible to this new build? And can those go through error free? So rather than saying, here's the differences between the last build and this build, because again, we don't know what differences dev intended to have. We say, here's how users are using your current application in a production mode. Let's try to do those user flows as close as possible on the new build and present that information because real regression is not about the last build. Real regression is always about what do your users do in production that, that uh, can apply to this build and can they do it error-free in this build, whatever that means, right? So we, that's what we really want to achieve. We've never been able to really achieve that because we could never look at production and know what they do. So we take business analysts and product managers that tell us what they think they're doing, which is just a guess on a guess. Um, so I hope that makes a little bit of sense. So we today don't show you what the differences are because it's overwhelming um, because we see we see every single difference. And it might be so overwhelming as to just bury you in data that's probably not useful because there should be a lot of differences, right? Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but we have the data, so we could post the difference file. Um, to, you know, this is the problem when you've got AI doing this work and doing it that fast, you can generate immense amounts of data. That's why I said QA engineers are now relegated up to saying, what does this all mean? I have more data than I've ever had. What do I care about? Which is a way better use of I think human brain power than scripting, just my own view. Samantha, should we continue? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you for those good questions. I Many of you have seen these charts. Uh, I, I didn't make up this chart. It's been around the industry for some time. Um, and it kind of shows you where people are in this industry. So this is levels of test automation or autonomy. Um, sometimes there's slightly different words here, but the, the basic concept is is the same. <clears throat> More 70 to 80% of testing in the industry today is at level zero. That's ab absolutely, you know, mind blowing at some level, right? But it tells you that the tools that have been delivered, including the open source tools, must be not very good, or else people, nobody would be at level zero today. And they're at level zero because scripting is hard and um, it, it has not shown as much gain uh, in terms of productivity in a lot of companies as they would like to see. In fact, in some companies, it's negative productivity just because the maintenance is so high, right? And we all know this. We've seen this on certain applications. So anyway, most people are still at level zero, obviously, maybe 20% or 15% or, you know, 20%, 25% are at level one. Uh, some people have moved to codeless capture and playback. I know that got a bad rap years ago. You know, recorders don't work, blah, blah, blah. It turns out a third generation recorder can work amazingly well and is much faster than, than scripting today. And I think people wiped those out of their memory and said, we're never going to use them again. But, you know, that came out of Mercury and Rational and, and much older technology than we have today. So I, I, I would encourage people to rethink uh, what you can do with codeless capture and playback. It's actually incredibly powerful. Uh, it is faster than scripting anything in Selenium. Um, uh, for example, 20%, uh, uh, 30%, 50%, 80% faster uh, and very powerful today. Um, so I, I'd encourage people to look at that. But nevertheless, there's a small percentage at level two, maybe three or four or 5% of the industry. Level three, self-healing. Um, uh, this, uh, this is a given. I mean, everybody should be using self-healing scripts. We uh, we happened to launch that in 2016. Uh, it's very cool. Uh, it works great. Can't self-heal everything, but self-heals most scripts and rewrites the script. But basically how it works is uh, it is a machine learning algorithm that, that keeps track of all of the different ways to locate uh, a, 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 an object, an accessor. 
and uh, later when a script is broken because of dynamic processors, XPath change, element ID change, text change, something change, it'll go back through and score all of the old ways plus new potential ways to locate that object. The most likely object that's on the page, say it's a submit button, that's probably still the submit button, and it'll pick that and see if that works. And if it does, it'll rewrite the script for you automatically. So that mimics what a human would do. You're given the application, the script breaks, you look at it and go, well, there's the submit button. Um, it doesn't say submit anymore, it says enter, it says something else, but nevertheless, I can I can use that. So we modeled what humans do and, and, can, and, and can fix a lot of the scripts. Maybe about 80% of them uh, get automatically fixed. So that's been a few years now. And then you get to level four, and this is where you've got near full, full automation. You've got auto-generated smart scripts. And finally, level five, we consider mind off, hands off, eyes off, auto generate smart scripts with validations with validations and we're going to talk about validations later um i have a lot of data here on how this these calculations work but basically q overall qa productivity goes up and we've been able to measure this as you get to level four and level five and level five is just the big win that's where it's really like this machine is doing more than i could do and i have a lot more to analyze and a lot more to work with and i have a lot of data coming out and it's incredible and that's where you get to validations. Before that, you automatically generate scripts and any kind of autonomy before that is sort of in the mud in comparison to the gains that you get as you get to uh, level five. Um, so we've seen this, we've been able to actually measure this and that's why you see some numbers here. It's, uh, uh, it's been really valuable learning over the last couple of years. So let me just talk quickly about how it works. This is how we work. Other people might do it differently. So the first thing, we already had designed a test platform that was a unified test platform, so it does all the different kinds of tests, and already had Test Designer, which is a, now a third generation, it was second generation then, but a third generation a sort of record uh, system. And, um, and it's very good and really uh, um, thoughtfully designed and, and very capable of all the modern uh, uh, libraries, React and, 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 and Kendo, et cetera. Um, and how we see this used is still, even with AI, people are writing very specific logic use cases with self-maintenance, but they're still writing them as end-to-end -end tests and test designer. Um, test designer will write an end-to-end -end test, it'll write an API test at the same time. You get both tests at the same time. You data drive them with simply drag and drop, um, and you can data drive from live data, you can data drive from a CSV file, from a database, doesn't matter. And then you ask machine learning to go ahead and generate those thousands of, of, of scripts, and that's going to enhance your coverage to nearly 100% of what users are doing. Um, and you can measure coverage in many ways, and you could say, do I care about anything that users don't do? Well, you might not, because they don't use that section of your application. But nevertheless, this is how we see people use it, and they use them in conjunction. So you'll notice scripting didn't go away, but it's lessened. You're not there writing thousands of scripts, you might say, there's 20 or 50 or 100 instead of thousands. Um, what this has done to the DevOps cycle, and we've, we've got many companies uh, of ours actually doing this that have deployed this, is they go from something that looks like this to something that looks like that. And this does not happen overnight. This is a you know six month to one year rollout and, and careful build out of what you're going to do with scripting versus AI and then leveraging all of that within the system. Now, one of the things we have to do that I think people haven't thought about a lot is if you want to do what humans are doing, you have to look at how humans do it. Well, humans, all of you bring all of this to your job. You bring knowledge and prediction and reasoning and estimation and critical thinking and hypotheses. You bring all of these, and that's why manual testing is actually surprisingly almost as good as, as automation in some cases. Because you know you can you can just walk through and it's obvious what the changes are and you just do them. So so there is no maintenance, and um, and that's a serious issue. So we had to look at this and say, how do we model what humans do in some way? And what was interesting out of that is most people think I'm going to implement an AI algorithm. It's going to write tests. But we found something completely different that. Uh, and again, you can go look at patents. Most of this is in our patents. Um, we have 19 areas of machine learning in the product today, and all of them learn one little thing, and, and then some other piece can use the thing that they learned on something else in the future, right? And the future might be one minute from now, or 10 minutes from now, or an hour from now, or 
tomorrow or whatever it is. And so there's little 19 little areas of machine learning in here that all work together. There's not one big AI algorithm. Again, someone else might be able to do this better, differently. I don't know. This is how we did it. And, um, and it works. So we're pretty happy happy with the outcome. It's, it's a lot of code to maintain. Now, our system is something like 4 million lines of code, you know, to be clear. It took many, many years to write in a very large team. Um, so it's a little bit different uh, uh, sort of direction than maybe other people are thinking. Um, just real quickly, how do we, how do, how at our core do we do some of this? Uh, well, we take over a, a browser in the case of uh, a web application, and we do that with a JavaScript injection. It's not a, a Chrome extension. It's not an adder. It, it actually just injects along with the application into uh, into every iframe. And from that, obviously, we can we can look at the entire DOM and we can we can see it and we can control it. And uniquely, we can see the UX all the way down to the server requests and server responses. So we can see and control the entire stack inside a browser. That is really cool and it's powerful and it's important as a core technology to this. <clears throat> so our AI driven testing, the way we decided to implement, and again, there's maybe there are probably better ways than we did it, but but we machine learn an application at the very build. And we don't keep a lot of that for the next build. We keep some, but not a lot, because we don't know how much you change in the next build. And that generates something called an application blueprint. And that basically is uh, all the pathways and user flows that might exist in your application. And we can generally learn that across 100 or more threads running in parallel in under an hour, 20, 30, 40 minutes or so. This is data driven as well. So you can drive it with thousands or millions of pieces of data. Um, the system can also generate a lot of its own data within a bound. So you can set boundaries and say, you know, generate zip codes and it, and it will, for example. And then there's a cognitive script generator that takes that input, takes regular production logs, this is optional, but if you've got them, and that will generate actual regression tests, right? And you get, you get reports out of both of those. Uh, in the AI blueprinting, uh, we have a component actions library that's pre-built into the system. We're not asking the system to go out and learn how those libraries work. We just taught it how to work. Um, and, and we give it something called AI hinting, which teaches, which basically the QA engineer can teach the AI about the application at some level. So it doesn't need to learn like there's 4 million pages of shoes. There's no reason to learn that when you only have to go to that page once or twice. And then we use this engine, uh, again, with 100 or more threads to create practical pathways. These aren't real user pathways. Uh, we learn all of the UI to HTTP request connections, and then we store that as a blueprint. And out of that comes an instant smoke test that usually finds hundreds of errors. It's really a very powerful right there. Um, ideally, you want your regression test to, to, to work off of production user flows, which we can do. And how that works is we take in that blueprint that we just learned over there in AI blueprinting, we do a recursive best match algorithm against regrouping these gigabytes of logs. So it's a big data problem, right? We regroup them into sections of, uh, we think we've seen these 200 requests before happen when this UI action happens. Uh, and, and out of that, we feed all of that to a code generator and we write actual end-to-end, -end, that is one, right? End-to-end -end, uh, user tests based on what we saw and what we learned from the logs and what we learned in the blueprint, what a user must have done. This is very complicated, but just know that all the data technically is there for us to have high confidence factors around each step at the end-to-end -end level, even though we have added nothing to the application. There's nothing in the application for tracking, there's nothing added, nothing we're just using the standard logs that have existed for 30 years w3c logs they're in every, they're on every production server so um it's really a powerful idea to reverse engineer that upscale it and create these sort of best matches at the at the ui level to automatically write tests um these are some simple tests that were automatically written these are all machine generated from a code generator there's no human involvement they were backwards generated up to a uh, a ux action from uh, what we gleaned from API logs at the server. Um, so that gives you an idea of how they work. So if someone wanted to see them, there they are. That's what they look like. And it's just JS. Um, one of the questions you might have is, can I edit it? Yes, there's an editor for these. But if you're generating 5,000 scripts by a machine, first of all, they're going to work. Second of all, if you edit them, you'll probably break them. Third of all, how are you gonna edit 5,000 scripts? It's not the point. The point is, let the machine generate it, let the machine run it, 
and let the machine give you the results. And by the way, this system will run thousands in parallel. So um, if your QA servers can take it, uh, you know, 5,000 scripts will be done in five or 10 minutes and give you all the results. So there's a lot of parallelism. Um, native mobile AI, uh, you know, we haven't announced anything here, but many people know in the industry, we've been delivering this to some uh, customers for a while. Um, it automatically tests and validates uh, native apps, both on iOS and, and Android, and extends all of our AI capability. Everything we did with web apps happens to work here. Uh, there are some things that are a lot easier with native mobile, and there are some things that are a little bit harder with native mobile, but it's obviously important. And, and, and how we do that inside our system, you don't see it, is actually adapt our JavaScript above test designer uh, directly above Appium, basically. So we can talk to both using Appium as sort of a go-between, um, but actually the, everything's written in JavaScript still. So all that JS still gets written in JS, and then it's adapted above Appium to a Appium Actions. So the last thing I want to talk about here, uh, and then we'll get to the, the rest of the questions, is uh, level five validation. So we talked about level five and what a validation is. Again, kind of think of it as an assert exists, but this goes a lot further. So we had to rename it to validations. There are three big areas, data-driven validations, automatic validations, and advanced validations. I'm just going to touch on each one just so you have a taste of what that means. Data-driven validations are where you have a set of input fields. And then you have some validation fields that you're going to check on some other page or some other output or whatever. And there may be hundreds of validation fields. I, I circled one here for, for this example. And there could be hundreds or thousands of, of, of input fields, hundreds of thousands of rows, right? What AI does, what our AI does, is it goes through each of these data sets and says, I must execute each one whenever I find the opportunity to do so. And this happens in blueprinting and it happens in um, uh, uh, in regression testing as well. So the idea is to use up as much or all of the data as possible and check it every single time it's possible. Uh, that's a powerful idea because remember, you're not writing a script here. It's writing a script for you that will allow this data set to actually execute. And it will execute it hundreds or thousands of times every time it sees the opportunity to do so. So you have to uh, separate your mind out from I'm going to validate this one thing on this one place by doing this and say I can now validate things throughout an application. Here's an example of an auto validation. It's a very simple one. You'll see non-repairable is selected. Well, in this case, there are millions of pages and you want you want to know if when you click on non-repairable, does it take you to the literally the non-repairable page? And this is true for every single one of the things you can click on here. Does it take you to the right place? Well, that's very hard to test um, any other way because it's hard to write a script that says go to every single page. It's actually, I don't know how to write that. That's pretty hard to do. So here, of course, AI will just go to every single page. It's what it does. It says go to every single page. So it goes to every single page and it checks this every single time, yet I have not written a single script, not one. And it'll check that as an example. It's one example, but it could be hundreds. It'll check that validation every single time, which happens to be really cool. It's something we want to validate. The most complex of validations, and there's, there's lots of different kinds, but I just want to share this one, is when you have a dynamic validation. Um, and here's a dynamic example. There are four boxes here. You can see here the Garth channel, 12 new shows, et cetera. It's an example of many, many dynamic applications where that could be four boxes or three or two or one or eight. It changes literally by the second, depending on what's going on. Is there news? Is there something for this user? Whatever. That's very hard to test. It's dynamic uh, uh, content that changes by the second, changes per user. How do you test that? Well, AI doesn't have any problem because it has access both to the API and the UX. So it can actually read the API, look at what the server said to display, then check the display and say, did the UX respond appropriately? And, and did it put the right number of boxes uh, uh, you know, how many did the server say to be displayed and are they the right ones in the right order, right? Can do that for you, not just once, but thousands and thousands of times as it, as it moves through the application. So in fact, this is the kind of thing where we find dynamic actions might be uh, right 87% of the time, but broken 13% of the time. And the system will actually then recreate a script to recreate the ones that are broken. And, it's, and it hands you the script to do that, which is absolutely fascinating. You just rerun it and say, yeah, it's broken when you do these steps and finally get to that page. Um, so there's a lot of that. Um, you can So, so uh, the favorite storage, like I want to store three favorites, then erase three favorites, make sure they got stored, blah, 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 make sure they got erased. 
it'll do that thousands of times every time it sees a favorites opportunity. Things like that are things that get repeated throughout the application, not just done once, like you would normally do it with a script. It'll do it thousands of times and, and you know find real issues. So sort of the outcome is you have an opportunity to get 100% blueprint coverage of all the actions and unique pages, 100% production user flow coverage, and essentially no maintenance because they all get rewritten at every, at every new build. So real quickly, what are the challenges? Well, there are challenges. Uniquely data-driven workflows are not always the best target because the outcome depends very specifically on the data. And I'm not talking about just data outcome, but the data might drive completely what page you go to. And that's a little harder to deal with because, for example, we don't have that data. We don't have binaries from production servers. So there, those might not be the best target to work with at first. It's fine if they take you to the same page with different content that was data-driven. But if it's uh, literally, you, you know, you go to totally different sections of the, of the application based on some data that someone put in. And again, not drop-down box data, but literally form data. That's a challenge right now. Uh, set up an AI hinting must be done by the vendor today, not the client, because it takes a ton of training to do AI hinting and you want people doing it who know how to do it. Um, so it, this isn't something that you just turn over to someone and say, wish you the best of luck with it. Patience is an absolute virtue. Um, successful AI POCs, set your expectations wisely. Uh, real, first of all, real AI vendors don't do work for free, period. Um, and this is AI across all industries today. If you go to automation anywhere and you're trying to automate processes and customer service, you know they don't do that for free. They come in, they work with you for months, it costs real money to do that. You will have a real outcome, it isn't free. Uh, and, and I think that's true with all real AI. Real AI is not something you download and try. There's, not, there's nothing to try. You'd have The setup itself is very time consuming, is very thoughtful, and takes real expertise and sophistication. Um, it, it, I would plan on weeks to install. Often this is installed behind your firewall, although we have a SaaS version by chance, but often it's behind the firewall. Um, six to 12 months to learn and tune, one to two years to have the 80% impact you expect. Uh, we certainly see tremendous impact within two or three months, but if you want the bigger and bigger, bigger impact, that takes time and you just gotta set your expectations. And nobody else wants to tell you this, but this is what we've learned and this is what we find to be true. So you just gotta set your expectations, uh, uh, be willing to you know, pay for POCs, be willing to partner with a vendor that wants to partner with you and help you be successful, and you will be successful, but it will take time and there'll be ups and downs. What are the outcomes that we've seen? QA runs that validate more than before in a 10th or 100th of time? Absolutely, absolutely. Over the course of six months to a year, True. Over the course of a week, not true. Takes time. Find a lot more bugs, but then who decides if they are important? Because now you're finding 10 times the bugs you ever found before. Which ones are important? Who's going to decide if they're important? It's a very interesting question, a very interesting problem, by the way. Uh, firms rethink what their QA people do. More test data, better analysis, more tests, more validations. That's what we see people doing immediately. They just move right up the ladder. It elevates the role of QA or devs doing QA. It really does. Um, so I think it's incredibly powerful. Uh, and so it's faster, it's better coverage, but now you need more analysis and more test data to drive it. The key motivator for clients has been time and coverage. You know, we have to go faster. We can't do it with just people writing and maintaining scripts. It's impossible. You hit a wall. And so they don't, they don't have any choice but to deploy some kind of technology that can move them forward. And if they've already moved to automation five years ago, they're, they're at the limit today. That, that's it. There's too much maintenance. It takes too long. The applications are too big. We're going to have to deploy something that gives us confidence in two hours as opposed to two days or two weeks. It does become the cornerstone and decider of a DevOps pipeline. Absolutely. We've seen it over and over again. And immediately people are, are, are using this as their core to DevOps as they gain trust. Um, it, it drives a continuous testing culture, but it takes time to trust the AI results. At first, people don't trust them, and I don't suggest you do. I suggest you use them to the side to augment your knowledge about the application, and little by little, you gain trust in it. So I am done with my portion. We are open for questions for about uh, seven or eight minutes, I think. Smitha, take it away. Thank you, everybody. Yes, Kevin. First of all, thank you so much. It was a very insightful session. Uh, we do have couple, uh, like tons of questions, so I'm going to couple a couple, like a few of them uh, where I see similarities in them. Okay. Yep. All right. So here are two questions which are on similar lines that I'm going to bring them up to you. So I'm going to first read out the two questions and then you can answer them at once. So the first one is, 
What is your advice to someone that says they are working for one of the few companies today that are not using or planning to use AI, but the person wants to implement it into their practice? The second one is, I want to implement AI uh, automation in my team from where I can start and what action plan should I take? Okay, so the first thing is, let's answer the first one. You know, look, successful organizations have to buy, have to have buy-in from the top to the bottom. <clears throat> and that means you need all of your QA engineers bought in to make this successful, or it won't be a success. It just won't be a success. And you need managers, directors, vice presidents, probably all the way up to the CIO bought in to make this program a success. It costs money, it takes time, and it takes resources. Uh, and, and I can tell you again, because I work with a lot of companies across the AI industry, whether it's customer support or AI in sales or AI in banking, this is the CIO on down has bought into over the next year, we're going to attempt to roll this out and we're gonna see these gains from it. And they set those goals and everybody buys into that is good for the organization. You can't do it alone. So if you're, you know, if you're a QA automation engineer and you go, I think we should have AI, but nobody above me believes in it, leave. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's, that's what you should do. The second thing is, Look, you need to run real POCs with real vendors. You need to have a real budget for that, and you need to do it uh, uh, in a partnership with someone that you trust, with a vendor you trust, with, with a team that you trust. Uh, this is all about trust, and it's all about people working hard on both sides. I can tell you every single application that we see, almost every single application, brings some new issue that we never thought about, that someone never thought about. That's okay, we expect that because we haven't done thousands of applications. We've, I think AI has been used in hundreds of applications now. So every new application might have something that we never saw. And our goal is to get over that hump and get to the success line. And we will dedicate a team of devs to go solve that problem in AI. That might take a few weeks or a month or something like that, but we're going to make the client successful. But that's why I said it takes time. This is, this is early in the AI space and people are seeing tremendous success with patients. And with zero patients, no success. I, I had one company that, you know, after a week goes, nothing's worked, we give up. I said, it's been a week. We haven't even finished the install. You, you haven't even uh, uh, gotten um, some security issues out of the way. I mean, you know, from SecOps. So can't even work yet, right? Uh, so give it time, give it patience, give it a little bit of budget, dedicate people to it to make it a success, make it a programmatic success. And I can assure you, 100% of ours are successful, but they take time. And time is of the essence. Thank you, Kevin. Um, quickly, the next one. Uh, so how can an individual actually start learning about it? And can you please share some open source projects that leverage uh, AI or machine learning techniques, <clears throat> which they can look at or use in our tests? There, there are no open source there's no open source that I've seen that has anything particularly useful. There's certainly no automatic test generation open source. And part of the reason is this is 4 million lines of code. Who would open source 4 million lines of code? I mean, it, you know, it, it, you know, this costs tens of millions of dollars to create, uh, to be truthful, right? So, um, the, the, you know, <laughs> I like to say, you know, open source is free for a reason, right? Uh, so uh, I don't think this is an area of, I can try something for free. We have nothing for free. And we have, part of the reason we have nothing for free even to try is that the setup takes real resources on our side. And we have to partner with you for many, many, many weeks to get the install done, to learn your application, to set up AI hinting and smart tags, and finally start to have some output. Nobody's gonna do that for free. I mean, maybe someone will do it for free. We're not gonna do it for free. I, you know, it dedicates real resources. So there are white papers we have. Please download our white papers. They describe this in detail. You can you can obviously look up our AI patents. Um, they're large. You can read all about it. You can certainly learn. But ultimately, if you want to use this, you're going. You know, you 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 know, you have to <laughs> buy it or do a POC. Um, however, at the um, at the SDPCon Fall Conference will be running a session where you will be able to get, for the first time, absolutely hands-on, set it up, run real AI tests and get and real code generation and everything, and get your test results. So we're going to teach people how to do that there uh, over a couple of hours, and I think that'll be really exciting. Thank you, Kevin. Um, 
we are running over time, so I'll just ask two more questions, and there are so many, so we'll send them over to you for you to respond, and then we can sure. publish your responses on the blog. Okay, so here's the next question. How much defect detection efficiency, efficiency sorry, is achieved leveraging this methodology? Mm. How much defect detection, what was the second part of that? Defect Shit. detection at the... Yeah, defect is achieved leveraging oh, this. Well, okay, so... In theory, in theory, the system will get to 100% of actions and pages and 100% of real production user flows. That's in theory. We are really seeing those 100% numbers. Now the question is, does that 100% number get to 100% of defects? Well, it depends, like everything else in QA. Um, you know, look, if there are sections of the application that no user ever uses, we're not going to find defects there, uh, or we may find limited defects there, right? Because we can't use it how the user uses it because no one ever goes there. But then the question is, do you care? Like, do you care? If no one ever, if no one ever buys shoes in the shoe store, do you care if you tested shoes in the shoe store? Over the last six weeks, no one ever bought a shoe. Maybe you don't care. It's a question for all of us in the industry, right? If, you, if you're gonna test the things, you wanna test the things that are most important. And we, by nature, now test the things that are most important, that are used the most. Things that are never used may get tested less. Is that okay? Maybe it's okay. Um, I can say this, that the system finds 10 or 20 or 30 times more defects than any human set of scripts that we've seen at any company. So anytime you go in and they've got all their scripts running and then this comes in, it finds a whole new set of defects. And the first thing that happens is QA and dev says, those can't be real. And within a few weeks, they acknowledge they were real and they fixed them all, interestingly enough. So um, it, 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 isn't, it doesn't find a lot of false positives. They really are real defects. And then again, you have to decide if you care and why didn't you find them in the past and why are these slowing down pages and and and, right? Um, so uh, I, I think you'll find it finds a lot more than we can find by writing scripts or by manual testing, just because it's a machine. You write 5,000 scripts in 10 minutes, it's literally a machine. It's pretty good at mm -hmm. it. All right, I'm gonna ask you the final question at least live on the webinar, and then yeah, we'll take sure. them up later. Sure. So is, is this recommended for medical device testing, which, is, which has a highly regulated environment yeah. by FDA? <clears throat> that is a great question. So um, I know that space actually <laughs> fairly well. And I, so, so software for uh, software for controlling medical devices, uh, let's say, or software in the med space. Um, what the FDA seems to uh, so so any changes in software have to be uh, uh, have to be validated that they the fundamental uh, results didn't change. And so uh, you can do that with scripts. You can do that with AI, and you can do that with a combination. My sense of it, and it's a longer conversation, is more and consistent testing is more likely to be accepted by the FDA as confirmation that the software outcomes didn't change and that the algorithms work the same. Now, all of that is based on data driving inputs and outputs, because that's really what you're doing. It's, it's more than testing the software, it's testing the data driven inputs and outputs. And so, yes, people are using us in the medical space uh, that, uh, uh, that seek uh, uh, the FDA confirmation that these tests continue to validate their applications that they haven't changed. Because that's what the, I don't want to be the expert on FDA. There are people on this call that probably are. But, but the bottom line is you're trying to guarantee the FDA that uh, I'm making it up, that uh, if, if a piece of equipment was going to designate that someone was having a heart attack, based on these three criteria, that it indeed does the exact same thing every single time. So think of it this way. AI, the AI portions of this technology, augment what you're already doing, add to what you're doing, they don't take anything away. And on day one, you might not write one less script than you've already got, but your coverage might improve 90%, like immensely. And so that's what you do at first. You're augmenting what you do. And finally, in time, you start to pull back on the number of scripts that you write, and you start to increase the amount of data that AI can use. And now everything is about data driving and not writing the scripts. Let, let the system write the scripts. But I want to give it more and more data to validate that I've got real outcomes that are correct, that the algorithms are working right. That's what we see is happening. I think it's a fascinating change 
And, um, you know, we'll see if that continues over the coming years. Hope that answers the question a bit. Yes. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. Um, it was a very insightful session on the use of AI in testing. And uh, many thanks for sharing all the details. I'm sure our attendees found it very informative and useful too. So thank you. And I hope to see you at STPCon soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for having me and for having the first live video webinar that you've done. So I'm honored to be part of that. Yes. Thank you so much for making that happen. Thanks, everybody. Well, everyone, this concludes our webinar for today. Thank you for joining in. And more importantly, thank you for being so engaging and making the most of the webinar for yourself and the whole group. Stay tuned for more webinars and online trainings coming soon at softwaretestpro.com. And if you haven't yet signed up for the upcoming webinar, which is Zero Automation to Zero Fear in More Than Zero Minutes on 22nd of May, then please go ahead. Uh, the speaker is Brian Fitz, uh, Fitzpatrick, who is the quality engineer for Gannett. And like I said, it's going to be a talk uh, about the basics around transitioning on uh, transitioning to DevOps. So if the topic does interest you, please register for the same at softwaretestpro.com. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week ahead. See you all in Boston in September. And keep practicing your testing. Thank you. <laughs>